Good evening and thank you for joining us on Zoom and here in Sturm Hall, the home of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, or as we here call it, CAUSE. Welcome to all of our students, alumni, friends, staff, and faculty, as well as our dedicated CAUSE Alumni Council members, both current and former. And I'd just like to ask, if you are a former or current alumni council member, would you raise your hand so we can recognize you? Thank you. I also want to thank um, Jake Jensen, um, and our marketing and communications director here in the college and the digital media folks here are here helping us today to make sure that you all can hear us in the audience here in person and also on Zoom. And happy homecoming to everyone. I'm Rhonda Gonzalez and I'm the Dean of CAUSE and I'm delighted to be here at our annual John Livingston Endowed Lecture Series in World History. This annual lecture invites a CAUSE faculty member to present their work to a broader community. The late professor, John Livingston, was an esteemed professor of history and the chair of the department here in CAUSE. He was not only a colleague, but also a dear friend to many in the DU family of staff and faculty who had the pleasure of working with him. This lecture series honors not only John, but also his wife, Nancy. And if you haven't met Nancy, she's wearing red and black, and we did not coordinate that. <laughs> so please, those who knew and worked with John knew that theirs was a true partnership. He and Nancy came up with the idea for this lecture series when he was ill, and they were thinking of a way to honor his legacy here at DU. Nancy is here with us tonight. And Nancy, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand up. There you are. For years, Nancy has continued to carry forward his academic legacy by being an active member of our community and helping us with this wonderful lecture series. Thank you, Nancy. One quick note before we get started, we are live streaming this lecture on Zoom and recording it as well. The recording will be made available on YouTube and our What Do You website. With that, I'm I am honored to introduce our speaker for tonight, Kareem E. Dumari E. Dumahuri is an assistant professor of media and journalism studies here in CAUSE, a faculty, faculty affiliate in the Center of Middle East Studies, founder and director of DU Media, and a CNN international journalist and producer. He received his PhD from Georgia State University. Kareem's research focuses on visual communication, media and conflict, and international and intercultural communication. Much of his work in recent years has centered on the use of new media and visual communication and nation states, as well as on the emergence of alternative proto, excuse me, including, let me back up here, make sure I get it all. Much of his work in recent years has centered on the use of new media and visual communication strategies by violent militant groups, including ISIS and Al Qaeda and nation states, as well as on the emergence of alternative proto-state media systems. His recent book is titled Photographic Warfare, ISIS, Egypt, and the Online Battle for Sinai, and it dissects the visual contestation phenomenon between militant groups and nation states, using Egypt as a case study. Kareem's work has also appeared in numerous other journals as well. Please join me tonight in welcoming Kareem. Hello, thank you very much for making it here today. It's such an honor. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thanks, Rhonda, and thanks for everybody. Um, all right, let me set the timing here. All right, so Egypt is burning. Those were the three words that my mom kept telling me over and over again when I was in Egyptian military. I was actually drafted into the Egyptian military two days before the Egyptian revolution in January 2011. So. I had three minutes of a phone call every day, and I would give that to my mom to call her. And after the revolution started, 
she would cry and keep telling me, Egypt is burning, Karim, Egypt is burning, Karim, Egypt is burning. And I didn't understand what was going on. The other thing that I knew or the other device that I could use to really understand what was going outside the walls of basic training camp was essentially that portable radio. Um, on it, there was a lot of patriotic songs. And every now and then I would listen to Mubarak speeches. And I remember one speech that was very interesting because he actually decided that he's gonna be stepping down. And for me, as somebody who was born eight years after he came to office, that was like, good deal. So guys, go home. Why are you still in Tahrir Square and other places, right? Um, but then when on my first break from basic training camp, when I started seeing the visuals, and I started seeing how united people were and how brutal the law enforcement was and how many people were killed and how many people were intentionally shot in the eyes, I started to realize that whatever I'm gonna be doing, whether it's as a TV producer, multimedia journalist, as an academic, visuals is definitely gonna be a big part of it. So 11 years later, with two books published on the topic and over 20 articles in, journal, uh, in journals um, internationally and here in the US, and thousands of photographs that have been analyzed manually, as well as hundreds of hours of videos examined, visuals never cease to amaze me. It's still fascinating. I learn stuff about them every day. And actually, that's why I'm here today, just to share with you key things that I've learned over the past 11 years um, about visuals and actually how visuals can be weaponized by extremist actors and by some nation states. Um, it is very well known that visuals are powerful. So I'm gonna share with you just very briefly how experimental studies have found that visuals have the power to grab attention, to increase retention, to influence perception, to constitute and reinforce identities and also to manipulate. I'm gonna leave those here up for a few seconds here. Five billion YouTube videos watched daily. Over a trillion photographs taken every year. Over 30 minutes of TikTok usage every day. We are bombarded by visual messages every minute of the day. So let me stop here and ask you for a second. When you hear the word propaganda, who thinks of something positive on a raise of hands? <laughs> How about negative? So almost all, if not everybody, thinks of propaganda as something negative, right? But ha that hasn't always been the case. The word propaganda um, comes from the root word propagare in Latin, basically to propagate. It goes back to its usage to the Catholic Church and how um, they established the congregation of propaganda of the faith. And then a few years later, Pope Urban VIII established the College of Propaganda. And the College of Propaganda was basically to train missionaries to spread the faith. That was it. But actually, propaganda can, get, can go way more when it intersects with violence and with battlefields. This is a painting on a cave in Spain that dates back between 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. It shows a group of archers surrounding others and fighting them. This on my right, to your left, is um, from ancient Egypt. And this is basically Egyptians defending a fortress against foreign enemies. And the one on the right, King Tot, leading his army into battle. And then with the advent of photography, it even you know, increased tenfold, if not more. And the first main juncture in which photography played a role in battlefields and warfare was the British Crimean War of the 19th century. And of course, a few years later, the US Civil War as well, right? And this is from the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam in the US Civil War. But then it was after World War I that propaganda started acquiring a negative connotation. It's pretty evident with you know, posters like this from the US vilifying Germany as the Hun, or Brit Britain using a lot of magazines that are mainly photographic and sharing them in many different languages around the world. And of course, with the Ministry of Propaganda in Nazi Germany, and how they used films and posters in order to vilify Jews and other groups. So it's no 
surprise that non-state actors and extremist actors are going to be learning from state techniques in order to forward their messaging. And Al-Qaeda was a pioneer in that, in terms of like a non-state actor having its own media system in a way. And then ISIS, of course, learned from Al-Qaeda and expanded even further. So let's take a look at a snippet of an ISIS video that came in 2015. This is our Khilafah in all its glory, remaining and expanding. It was established in the year 1435 Hijri. Its leader from the tribe of Quraysh is Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and its territory is already greater than Britain, eight times the size of Belgium and 30 times the size of Qatar. It's a state built on the prophetic methodology, striving to follow the Quran and Sunnah not a secular state built on man-made laws whose soldiers fight for the interests of Bahut legislators, liars, fornicators, corporations, and for the freedoms of sodomites. We are men honored with Islam who climbed its peaks to perform jihad, answering the call to unite under one flag. This is the source of our glory, our obedience to our Lord. We are uncompromising in our call to Tawheed. We only bow to Allah unlike the countless deviant factions raising their false banners and changing with the winds of Jahili politics. Yes, we are the soldiers who stop the idols of nationalism, demolish the shifty symbols of Palmyra and Ninoa, and destroy the sykes Pico borders. For there is no honor to be found in the remnants of shirk and nationalism, and no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab, or a black man and a white man, except through piety. This is the glory of faith that unites us. Justice is served with the establishment of the Islamic courts, and there are thousands of masajid and schools for our cubs and pearls, where they prepare themselves to share in the great rewards of expanding this Khilafah. America, you claim to have the greatest army history has known. You may have the numbers and weapons, but your soldiers lack the will and resolve. Still scarred from their defeats in Afghanistan and Iraq, they return dead or suicidal, with over 6,500 of them killing themselves each year. So while you go around cooking the facts on the results of your military airstrikes, we continue to haunt the minds of your soldiers and sow fear into their hearts, with 18 of your soldiers committing suicide each day before you've even advanced. And in addition to the $6 trillion price tag on your war against them, and the use of media by groups like ISIS. What I want to touch on here is that even though propaganda is being thought, of, you know, it has a negative connotation now, pretty much everybody in the room thought so, right? Propaganda now is very sophisticated that it is not just, you know, fake or manipulated information only. It's a pot and in it, it's a mixture of truths, half truths, truths out of context, etc. It's very contextual. Right here in the US, many people would think of media from North Korea or from Iran or from Russia as propaganda. But the odds are some people in other parts of the country think of the US media the same way. Right. So it's very contextual and it's othering. Right. So how did I come here? How did I come to study those type of things? And that goes back to 2014 when I was in my studio apartment in New York doing an internship at the UN. And guess what? I was actually doing my thesis on product placements in films. I was just about fun, you know? So I was examining product placements as a commercial practice, like, you know, the Wilson Ball in Cast Away, for example. And then around that time, with the notorious rise of ISIS, there was that video that came out. It's called Salil al Sawarim, which translates into Clanging of the Swords, a one hour long video. So, sort of like a documentary in a way. And it was actually the fourth part of a series under the same name. And this video was associated and reportedly so that some Iraqi soldiers abandoned their posts upon watching this as a way of psychological warfare. And that laid the stage to ISIS storming into Mosul, one of the biggest cities in Iraq. Okay, So it was around that time that I thought, okay, this is placement going on. It's not product, but it's an ideology. And that's just turned my entire career and thought, I need to study this. 
So I'm going to share with you four main aspects that I've come across in ISIS visuals and other extremists, whether on the white supremacist camp as well, the far right, as well as other type of groups, because they share a lot of commonalities, by the way. So one thing is the idea of a borderless entity. ISIS, when it's sharing its maps, it basically defies borders of the nation state. Okay, so here on the top left, it's between Iraq and Syria, and there's no border. They just disregard any borders. And as you've heard in the video, Sykes-Pico, ending Sykes-Pico, right, which is related to the idea of breaking down the MENA region into states, right? And even when they do put a border, like here between Jordan and Lebanon, they say those are the artificial Jordanian borders, okay? So that goes to say how they complement the visuals with the slogan of ISIS remaining and expanding, right? And how they complement that in their own visual narrative. The other thing is utopianism. And you probably got a sneak peek on that from the video that I just shared earlier. And this is a commonality that is across extremist actors. Far right does use that as well. Because at the end of the day, you need to present a better alternative. So you try to project a utopia or at least the utopia that you're trying to attain. So those are images that you probably don't see in mainstream media. Why? Because let's be real, they are not newsworthy. What is newsworthy is a beheading. What is a newsworthy is, you know, a pilot that is being uh, burned to death, an execution, a big attack, right? So those are actually the most frequent type of images up until 2015, 2016 that ISIS were putting out emphasizing and reinforcing the idea of that a utopia has been attained. Agriculture, healthcare, kids learning, fixing roads, etc. And also schools that they're having out there, and this is a screen grab from the video, there is no race. Everybody is equal, right? The other thing is strategy. ISIS is very visually strategic. This is a book by an esteemed professor by the name Barbie Zillitzer. It's called About to Die. It talks about something that we all experience in our media consumption, but she goes a little bit into details about it. The About to Die visual trope is essentially how the Western media and mainly the US media, rather than showing corpses, deadly corpses on TV or on, on you know, photographs, they would actually portray impending death. Remember that image after 9-11, it was published in New York Times and it was showing the fallen man right um, and then here the uh, buddhist monk in vietnam in 1963 who burned himself to death because of protesting um, after the persecution of buddhists there so here what barbie says is that here the photograph freezes the most pregnant moment of the action and that it's actually less graphic but it's in a way it's very engaging because you can't help but think okay what was this man doing before he falls what happened after he fell? So the idea of freezing the impending death is something that the media uses to avoid graphicness, but ISIS uses it actually intentionally in order to disrupt mainstream media. So this is an image of James Foley, um, a journalist who was executed and beheaded by ISIS. The media had a choice between using ISIS's own visual and just an image of James Foley doing his work, right? But for the most part, mainstream media went down that route, even if they superimpose text on it that says evil or savage or whatever. This is still disruptive to the mainstream media and it's serving the purpose of ISIS in order to sow fear and spread that message. This is another case, Muaz al Kasesbe, who was a Jordanian pilot um, with the coalition and who was captured and he was burned to death in a 22 minute long video. And guess what Fox News did? Put the entire 22 minute video on their website. And other media also used the about to die images from ISIS rather than using him in uniform, right? But what ISIS even does further, it flips the entire visual trope of about to die on its head and it uses it with its own suicide bombers. So here you see people from all different, you know, countries what unites them is that they are happy they are pointing to the heavens we are doing this to the one god and they head out to the battlefield and they blow themselves up 
So what ISIS is doing here is using the about to die to actually build rapport and familiarity and intimacy with its suicide bombers and to argue that they are doing this willingly and blissfully. The other thing is visual literacy. See, here I teach um, multiple multimedia journalism classes at the intermediate, at the intro, and at the advanced level. I teach students about um, shot sizes, shot angles, when to use them, how to use them, how to use the visual in order to send a message, how to use lighting, etc. And actually, ISIS is teaching its own media agents the same thing I teach students here. And I know this for a fact because those come, are coming from a pamphlet that was seized by the US military in Afghanistan and the central media department of ISIS was distributing that pamphlet to the different provinces around you know, parts of Middle East and Asia and Africa. So it's not a coincidence that they use low camera angles looking up at their uh, militants on the battlefield in order to show them as grandiose, powerful and superior. Trust me, I did the math. I actually compared the chances of this occurring in ISIS's own photographs vis-a-vis -vis state actors that are contesting ISIS in the media sphere. So it's not a chance. This is a screen grab from Call of Duty. First person shooter games, they use that type of point of view shot, not haphazardly. They use it because it has been shown in experiments that this actually creates presence. It puts the person into the position of the character and you feel you are doing what they are doing essentially i tried multiple times in classes to show the best stunts that were done uh, using pov shots and gopro cameras and students would ask me to stop because they are feeling uneasy they are not doing the stunt but they feel as if they are doing it what isis does is rather than use it virtually they use it on the battlefield they put you in the position of fighting against state actors, killing them, going and holding their actual IDs, etc. Very visually literate. So the question then becomes, okay, you're telling us about how sophisticated they are and the themes they are putting out. Okay, what can we do? I cannot claim in a million years that the answer is just in the media sphere. Absolutely not, right? But I'm just throwing that out there, how to contest in the media sphere. There are other stuff to be done economically, politically, et cetera, for other grievances that are happening, et cetera. But here, what I'm sure about that in the media sphere, what does not happen is what the US State Department did in 2014. They put out a campaign, or 2015 as well, called Think Again, Turn Away, which was deemed by many um, reputable news sources as embarrassing as a shame as a failure what they did in a nutshell they were repackaging the actual visuals that isis would put out and they would just blaster them with like this is evil this is bad this is you know so it was very shallow culturally insensitive very religiously unnuanced same goes with having talking heads many ngos get mothers to speak about the plight they've gone through with their kids leaving and joining isis and then dying Yes, okay, it's emotional, but at the end of the day, it doesn't compete against the engaging visual narrative that ISIS is putting out. Same goes with posters around the Arab world saying terrorism has no religion. Okay, again, it doesn't compete with the visual narrative of ISIS. What I've seen works to some extent is faith-based entertainment education. This is a TV series that's called Al Siham Al Mariqa, which translates into piercing arrows or rogue arrows, depending on what translation you use. It was actually put out by, created and produced by a Muslim televangelist. So it was very religiously nuanced and culturally sensitive. It was 30 episodes. They were put out on two of the biggest satellite TV stations in the Arab world. And all 30 episodes were put for free on YouTube for people to watch. And that's how I was able to examine over 8,600 comments across the, um, the, the 30 episodes and identify that something was happening in there that is called parasocial interaction. To explain that in a nutshell, when you're watching the movie Rocky, for example, and you're saying you're rooting for Rocky and go Rocky, if you lose, oh my God, I'm gonna be you know, very sad, right? You are now engaging with a fictional character. This is parasocial interaction. It, developing sort of a pseudo friendship with a fictional character. So it's one-sided. But guess what? It actually helps in narrative persuasion. And that has been shown in entertainment education that tries to spread pro-social messages. So 
What I found here is that at least 17% of the comments expressed parasocial. I'm saying expressed and I'm stressing on it because not everybody who watches a YouTube video would leave a comment. So I'm sure this is happening way more than this, right? Let's take a look at some examples. This was a character, a Lebanese woman who was living in an area that is controlled by ISIS and she was joining the resistance movement underground and fighting against ISIS, okay? So when she was about to be punished, you see comments, a lot of comments actually, this is just one example. Oh my God, if you kill Habiba, if they do, I'll be deeply saddened. Habiba is the fictional name, it's not the actor's name. So you see the engagement with the fictional character. Same goes, an Egyptian media professional who gets kidnapped by ISIS and in order to survive, he pretends to be joining ISIS and helping them out until his conscience awakes and then he is fighting them in the resistance movement. Again, you're a hero, you're a great human being, etc. The opposite side of the spectrum, people who refuse to repent, who refuse to change the, their distorted views of religion and the heinous acts that they are committing get deemed, you know, devils, and, and trust me, this has been filtered. So devils, hypocrites, trash, etc. So you get the point. So back to ISIS. ISIS has been cracked down upon along with Al-Qaeda and other groups that uh, belong to the Islamist extremist camp on social media. Not as much the far right, by the way. So the Islamist, act, the Islamist groups have been um, cracked down upon. And what social media does in the meantime is actually amplify messages of nation states that basically just open an outlet and push it out there and then it looks legit. This is a graph that shows how much money was spent on media operations by other states in the US. China, $64 million in just one year in the US alone. Russia, $42 million. RT, which is the most, I would argue, propagandistic of all, and is very explicit in that sense, even though it has been cracked down upon on YouTube lately after the war in Ukraine and on Telegram as well, it is still operating on Instagram in many different languages and to millions of viewers. This is just a sneak peek at stuff that they put out there. So Putin being deemed as somebody who's defending Russia against terrorist Ukraine, Boris Johnson, uh, Johnson mocking him over and over again, and I'm sure something is gonna be, or some, something may have already been posted about mistrust today, and sowing distrust in health experts. Shifting gears to China, China has a very sophisticated media, global media system that is operating around the world. It is co-producing content with other media outlets around the world. It is somehow imposing pressure so that any critical voices against China are silenced. It is um, actually pushing out there its own visuals across China and mainland for other outlets to use, so also amplifying their visual narrative. And what I've done at the beginning, um, you know, around the beginning of COVID is looked at how Xinhua, the, the main news agency of China in its English language operations, how it perceived or projected or presented COVID. So it was posting around 10 photographs and just on the Instagram page of Xinhua per day. And those were almost always original. The reason why original here is highlighted because I've already compared what China does to other state-sponsored or state-supported um, outlets like Voice of America, for example, that mostly depends on Reuters, AP, AFP, etc. They rarely post anything that is original in terms of photographs on Instagram. But what that does, why does it matter? Because then you are very intentional in your choices when you're capturing those images. At the top here, this is a theme that was recurring often, which is basically fighting the battle, but the battle here is against an invisible enemy, COVID. From early on, the idea of a victorious China, that theme was amplified and um, reiterated upon. You see here how the healthcare workers are waving goodbye to somebody who was being treated. So in a way, you're waving goodbye to COVID as well. Who has the time to go out there and wave every patient goodbye? But this is original photography. They have their own photojournalist on the ground, right? The other theme is, again, victorious China. See here the flag and communist symbols, etc. And then healthcare workers are smiling and dancing and waving and doing the victory sign. When 
a lot of people are being dying around the world, right? The other thing is tapping into the idea of wise leadership. You see here at the top uh, right, um, Xi Jinping with the clenched fist motivating the healthcare workers on the battlefield, on the battlefront. You see also the idea of the humane warrior theme being reiterated over and over and over again. Healthcare workers leaving their work in order to comfort kids so that they can draw on their own, you know, suits here, waving or bidding farewell to their loved ones before they go out there on the battlefield. The idea is Xinhua presents itself as a global news agency. But when you actually look at what they focus on, 85% is on China, at least in the period that I was examining them. The others, Italy shows up, United States, South Korea, Australia. But let's take a look how they present other countries because this is as equally important, if not more. On the right side, two images from New York. At the top is in New York Stock Exchange. The US economy is doomed, right? At the bottom, also New York, facial masks are out of stock outside a pharmacy in New York. Here, South Korea, crowds lined up in order to get facial masks because there's a shortage. So all the shortages, all the economic repercussions, anything negative happening there, but everything positive happening here. Again, media response, what can we do about it? The first thing that jumps to mind, okay, let's crack down on them. Let's just block them and censor them, right? But that doesn't work. We've seen that with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. ISIS was being cracked up, uh, down upon on Twitter in 2015. They migrated to Telegram. And then Europol and, um, uh, and Telegram cracked down upon them in 2019. So they expanded to other encrypted messaging apps. And guess what? They came back to Telegram up until today. Censorship does not work. What does work, however, is the idea of media literacy. But before I get to media literacy, here, RT up until today are posting their content in multiple different languages. Chinese outlets, Xinhua on YouTube, almost 1 billion views. CGTN, English language operations, almost 2 billion views. And millions of followers that they are reaching out to across all the different social media platforms. So, so what is even more disturbing is that some studies show how the population is very prone to um, those messages. Here, it shows that 80% of mid-schoolers in the US, when handed an actual you know, sponsored ad, they would think that it is a real news story. Think about that for a second. A sponsored ad, and you would take it and think, oh, this is an actual real news story. 80% of high schoolers when handed out or subjected to spurious claims on social media, 80% lack serious questioning of that content. And even beyond that, one in every four Americans say that they are open to believing conspiracy theories. And those are the ones who say that they're open. <laughs> so the idea here, media literacy, Illinois, shout out to Illinois, they are the first state to actually require media literacy classes for high schoolers. Is this enough? I don't think it's enough, but it's a start. But what has been shown over and over again, and even in the statistics and the studies that I've shown earlier, that ones who get subjected to media literacy training are less likely to believe those ideas or those, um, to, to adopt those views. So it helps detect media bias especially in a country that is very partisan in its media like the US. Identify fake news and mis and disinformation and also debunk conspiracy theories. As I said, I don't think it's enough. I think it needs to be done in mid-school as well, as we've seen already with the very disturbing statistic about how um, you know, mid, middle, middle school students can fall victim to spurious claims on social media. High school, college, but also the wider community members. Right, And I really hope that this is something that can be implemented here at a much bigger scale in Colorado. The other thing is student media. If you think about it, 
the students who are studying media and journalism today, they are going to be the future journalists and media producers of the future. So they're going to be informing the public. So when they have legit training on media and media practices and journalism in school, whether it's podcasting, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's digital videos, writing, etc., this helps, right? So since I started with my mother informing me about what was happening outside the walls of basic military training camp, telling me what was happening at the time, I'm going to end with another mother who was gracious enough to call us and tell us that she's funding Dio Media, which is a student media platform at the Media Film and Journalism Studies Department that actually works with students to produce content and submit those content to competitions, etc. Students have been awarded to Emmy nominations. They've, been, they've gotten Tele Awards. They've gotten the Society of Professional Journalists um, Awards. They've gotten two, two years in a row the Future Broadcaster Award by the Colorado Broadcasters Association. So this mother reached out to us. Her way of saying thank you is she told us we're going to fund DU Media for this academic year. So for her and to you, I say thank you. This is like a prime example of something that needs to be incorporated in media literacy training, literally. I haven't done research on it per se, but in my capacity working as a journalist, this is something that is very concerning that we pay close attention to. Another thing regarding videos as well, that videos sometimes they surface maybe like three years after they were shot in order to say like, this is happening now. For example, Iran, and somebody would be posting a video that is happening in Georgia, you know? And then a lot of people would fall victim to that. So what we do is we try to geolocate the videos, make sure that this is happening. We actually go to Google Earth and compare the surroundings of that video to say, is that store still there? Did that happen that day? Let me look at the clouds. Was it cloudy that day if I look at the weather? So a lot of things that happen behind closed doors in newsrooms in order to verify that. And I hope that this would be something that would be incorporated in media literacy training for sure. sneeze first I think <laughs> it went away but the, thank you yeah so the question is about the role of nostalgia in um, the media operations of ISIS but also other groups right and the, the power of the past this actually ties to the utopia theme very well because essentially they are reaching out with that messaging that hey when was the last caliphate that you've seen it was the Ottoman caliphate and then, you know, it was, it died down and we haven't seen a caliphate and see how the, the Muslim countries are suffering ever since. So it must be the caliphate. This is the solution. And we are bringing the glory days back. One of the very interesting things they did visually is they actually minted their own coins and put out videos and photographs of that. And those, those actually were very similar to the ones during the Umayyad caliphate. So hearkening back to when uh, the, uh, the, the, the Umayyad Caliphate was in Andalusia, in the Iberian Peninsula, and in parts of Europe, right? So drawing that similarity. But also that happens in the far right. 
and the white supremacist groups. How? If you think about the great replacement theory, the idea is essentially we need to go back when the demographics were a certain way. We don't want them to change. So again, the idea of nostalgia is very vivid across them. And the commonalities between the ones on the Islamist camp and the white supremacists, it's very interesting. There are differences, of course, like the use of humor, for example. The far right and white supremacists, they are all about humor. Because, it, excuse me, because at the end of the day, you throw a joke that is offensive, and then you get told, like, why are you saying this? Oh, I'm just joking. So it's a strategy. But with ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they rarely use humor. And if they use it, it usually comes from American recruits who join them. So that happened with Al-Qaeda, with the Inspire magazine. If you remember the Boston bombings, the Boston bombings were actually tied to an article in, in Al-Qaeda's own English language magazine that was, that was titled, How to Make a Bomb in Your Mother's Kitchen. And that was written by an American guy. So the idea of humor as well. Please. Uh, you mentioned uh, media literacy um, for middle schoolers, high schoolers, people in college, and then you said the more general population. What would it look like in the more general population, given that from my perspective, the more ger the general population right now is really affecting how we're kind of seeing the world and where, and sometimes I see a younger people as being more media literate than some of us older folks. Thank you very much. I'm gonna repeat the question. The question is about media literacy and how I had mentioned uh, middle school, high school, college and community members and how um, younger folks may actually be more media literate than the, the, the older ones and how we can incorporate the community member, the wider community member. Um, I haven't figured all that out yet, but what I can envision that through the role of educational institutions is actually working with the public and, you know, throwing workshops, um, trainings, um, camps, events, et cetera, that would help. I would perhaps push back a little bit um, against the idea of younger folks being more media literate, not necessarily, because there are some very disturbing statistics, for example, about how a lot of youth cannot even name one of the amendments um, in the Constitution or one of the rights in the First Amendment in the Constitution, which was very disturbing when I was incorporating it in a class that I'm teaching here. So the idea of the plethora of media platforms and media messaging out there does not necessarily equate to literacy, unfortunately, because see what happens is that a lot of people get sucked up into echo chambers, right? And an echo chamber is essentially um, you search for what reinforces your beliefs and views, and you just stick to it. Why, why the hassle? Why listen to other, you know, I'm just here in my echo chamber, I'm comfortable, right? So this is another problem that is happening, also perpetrated by the algorithms and social media platforms. Oh, you like this? Take more of this, right? That's a very interesting question. I don't need to repeat it because it came from Zoom. Um, actually, if you historicize the, the visual media operations from extremist groups, um, it can date back to as far back as the Soviet war in Afghanistan, how the Afghan Mujahideen were actually implementing photography in their magazines and they were targeting. So they had like a magazine that is targeting women, another magazine that is targeting men, etc. And then from there, there were actually videos as well as far back as there, but it was very pixelated, very poor quality, as you can imagine, in the late 80s, right? But then what happened with the Chechen, uh, Chechen rebels when they were fighting the, the Russians, they started, the cameras were better, so they started incorporating that, and they were the pioneers of the idea, at least in, in recent history, the idea of ultraviolence as an attention-grabbing tool which we see with ISIS and Al-Qaeda to some extent. So what they were doing is essentially just, they would kill people and put them on camera because they were saying there was actually one of their media leaders had a quote that said, kill one Russian, but kill one Russian and show it to the Russians. 
that has a bigger impact, right? And then Al-Qaeda came in and started incorporating what they started doing is actually doing their own web forums. So that was before social media, right? All, of, all this is before social media. So web forums with Al-Qaeda, and then once, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and those type of things started, you know, popping up, they started jumping on that bandwagon. And of course, ISIS did the same. And of course, far right and white supremacist groups did the same. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem. Please, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. I believe many of us in the room learned so much. Um, thank you for sharing your important and fascinating research with all of us and um, look forward to learning more. And thank all of you for coming out tonight and or attending virtually to hear from one of our esteemed faculty and cause. It's such an honor to, for us to highlight our faculty in this way and we welcome you to more of our events. And of course, thank you Nancy Livingston for making this evening possible for us the arts, humanities, and social sciences help us better understand our world and our everyday lives. The College of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences strives to be the engine of intellectual and artistic expression, driving exploration and intellectual stimulation for our campus and our communities. The multidisciplinary nature of the liberal and creative arts equips our students with deep cultural understanding and appreciation discerning social and analytical skills and the flexibility and aptitude to adapt to constantly evolving job markets and community and global issues. Your support and engagement with our college provides students the opportunity to deepen the learning experiences and students' um, abilities to immerse themselves in projects that truly do change the world like DU Media. I encourage everyone here to participate in the other DU homecoming events happening this weekend, for instance, Saturday at 3 p.m. on the campus screen just in front of our building here is DU's signature homecoming program October festival with food trucks, a beer garden and family friendly activities and the DU community um, tents. And there are plenty more events happening all weekend and I encourage you to check those out and I hope to see some of you out there. Please check out, um, you can look for those events on the calendar for homecoming.edu. Uh, uh, and then finally, um, remember to check us out on liberalarts.du.edu or find our riveting uh, social media <laughs> platform uh, to learn more about what's going on here in CAUSE and, and, and at DU. I thank you once again for spending the evening with us. Thank you, Kareem, for generously sharing your work and um, have a great weekend.